Good afternoon. I just want to tell you, you are the most important people in the world. It's gloriously sunny outside, and lots of people are there, but they're not in here. You are. You are lucky. You're the most important people in the world. You have got great ideas. You've got enormous capacity. And my message to you is today that you're probably pretty good. And good is fine. I would hate it to be on my, de on my, my uh, headstone. Alistair Fee was fine. Good nowadays is not good enough. And I just want to let's explore that this afternoon. Let's consider these letters, RSG. Ready, set, go. Are you ready? I want you to think about where you are in your career. At university, post-university, or into a business. Where are you and where do you want to be next Friday? And we're going to explore R and D. Oh no. Research and development? I don't think so. R and D stand for lots of other things. And we'll find out what those are as the afternoon goes on or the next nine minutes. I want you to imagine that you are at Henley Regatta. I am a mad rower. My father was a mad rower. I spent my life running up and down riverbanks, rowing up and down water, screaming at people. And I was the captain of Queen's University Belfast Boat Club. And I'm very proud to be able to say that. And we were good, but we weren't great. So sometimes we won, sometimes we lost, sometimes it was fantastic, sometimes we curled up against the hedge and cried because Trinity College Dublin were faster than we were. And it was tough. We were training six, seven days a week. We thought this was man fantastic. Life has moved on, but imagine you're at Henley. Henley Regatta, the Thames Cup, 2,310 yards, six and a half minutes. You can row a mile and 550 yards in six and a half minutes if you're very, very good. And if you're not very, very good, the number says seven. Eight minutes, three seconds. Oh, how embarrassing and ashamed I would be. So at Queen's University, we thought, hey, what are we going to do? We need to design and devise and develop some sort of process that is radical and remarkable, R's and D's, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to do something better. So we got a coach from Cambridge. He was related to Attila the Hun. He was brutal. He had a look at us, at the crew. I wasn't in the crew, I'm coaching at this point. When I say us, I just mean the crew. And he said, hey guys, you're good. You have potential, but you're not great. So I'm going to make a list, he said, of things that make you go slowly. And here they are. If you do that, you go slowly. Too much of this, you go slowly. Too much of this, not good. And if you go late night dancing, you will not perform the next day. I want to challenge everybody in here to stop doing the things that makes you go slowly. Because if you don't get enough sleep, your brains will not be firing the next morning. There was a mutiny. The crew said, we're not giving all that up. A week later, they came back and they said, actually, we love the smell of victory. We're prepared to give up most of these things. And what happened? They went faster. So now just by stopping things that make you go slowly, you're going faster. It's that simple. Then he made another list. These things will make you go faster. Oily fish. Pumps up your lysine levels, your forebrain, every part of your body. More sleep. An extra hour. We'll not go into the Harvard Business School case studies on extra hours of sleep. No girlfriends. <laughs> there was a mutiny. They negotiated. They were allowed to have a girlfriend for 30 minutes a week. Not much. You don't mess around. You don't waste your 30 minutes. <laughs> they were allowed one bottle of beer a week. Then they had to eat better food. 7,000 calories of broccoli and mackerel plus pasta, pasta and more pasta. There they are. 
We taught them to dance. We taught them to run. We taught them to lift weights. And they went faster. How much faster? In 2009, they were the fastest university crew in Britain. They went to Moscow with a whole bunch of other guys and were the seventh fastest crew in Moscow, beating the Cambridge Under-23 lightweight eight. Last year, they were invited by Cambridge to come and pace them before the boat race because they were the fastest alternative crew to Oxford. They went faster because they developed, designed, delivered a process that delighted them. And we must delight our customers. They were remarkable because they were radical and relentless. Relentless is hard. Relentless means you have to be sacrificial. Relentless, some of you aren't prepared to be that relentless. But here is a pencil. This is going to be tricky. Here is a pencil. This is a yellow, cheap, nasty, horrible, ordinary, mediocre pencil. You can buy 10 of these for a pound. The value of this X factory is about a halfpenny. The wood is rubbish, the, the graphite is poor, the glue non-existent, and the people who made this are so ashamed of it that they haven't put their name on it. <laughs> I am fascinated by pencils. Pencils are great, you can leave your mark, you can make a mark, you can write on a napkin, you can come up with an idea on a notebook in the middle of the night with a pencil. You don't have to boot up your computer. I have the largest collection of pencils in Ireland. I keep them with my anorak collection. James Bond gave me one of his pens, as you can see. But this pencil was designed, was developed. It delivered delight to customers. Because this pencil is a Faber-Castell Grip 2001. <laughs> the European Pencil of the Year 2001. It's only a pencil. It has the best lead graphite in the world. It comes from uh, oh, somewhere east of the Urals, somewhere cold, Siberia, that's the place. The wood is the only wood that pencils should be made of, and someone will yell out, red cedar. And inside it, let's see what they've got, is the best glue ever put into pencils. What Faber-Castell did was they designed greatness and excellence into their pencil. They created a triangular shape so that three fingers holds it beautifully. They put little paint uh, nodules on it which they were able to patent. No other pencil manufacturer in the world can put those little dots. And they stopped the pencil sliding up and down. Inside, do you see that blue stuff in the middle? That is Faber-Castell glue. It is better than any other glue in pencils. It contains bubbles so that when you drop the pencil out the window 60 feet, it will bounce off the concrete and not damage the lead graphite. You can completely Faber-Castell your office, if you want. But what Faber-Castell did was they created a great pencil from scratch. And they then went on to delight customers of all sorts. Dare I say it, ladies' handbags, children with colouring pencils, artists and architects with pencils that contain rubber and little brushes so you can blow stuff off the page. They then went up further and they created this, the most expensive pencil in the world. I'll not tell you how much it is, you can Google it on www.cultpens.com if I'm allowed to say that. This pencil is plated in platinum, uh, it has a little eraser covered with a screw off top and inside the handle, if I can just demonstrate, is the most accurately made pencil sharpener on the planet, built almost to aerospace uh, specification. It is ridiculous. We all know that. <laughs> but this is a question of going further and doing more and, and attention to detail. Attention to detail is what the rowing club did, what Faber-Castell do. Every single aspect of a pencil matters, and it's only a pencil. And here we are at UCL, where everything you are doing is even more important. 
So to be uh, truly remarkable, you need to be radical and relentless. In Belfast, where I'm from, just outside, we have a company called Right Bus. Guess what they make? They're good. They were good back in the early 2000s. Good, but not great. And then 2008 came along and they had the worst two weeks of their lives. They lost four years of orders when two British bus companies went bankrupt. They lost 700 buses and there was panic in the, in the factory. We're going to go bankrupt. All the women and children in the neighborhood are going to not have any food. And the owner of the factory said, stop, we're not going bankrupt. We've lost business, but we're going to do something amazing. We are going to redesign a bus for the, all the markets that we haven't been able to get into. Asia, North Africa. And the, all the designer and engineer said, it can't be done. Our design time is 18 months and we are going to be bankrupt long before then. Well, we're going to have to change our design time. And they moved everybody, all the engineers, into an office with sleeping bags and mattresses, with a pizza delivery boy. And they drove their design time from 18 months to eight weeks. And in that time, they were able to come up with not an ordinary bus, but a bus that would tilt the rules of the game and was able to get into other markets. They got into the Far East, Hong Kong, Indonesia. And the guys out there said, what's happened to you guys? And they said, the economic downturn. So, design, delight, devise, delivering, new product. At the same time, Boris Johnson sent out a tender to the world and he said, I want a wonderfully eco-friendly green bus for the Olympic Games in 2012. And the right bus guys sat down and said, we're going to enter this competition and we're going to win. And they did. And so during the Olympic Games, they delivered 15 buses, which was the initial order, and they're now making another 250. So look out for those as they go around the city. How did this work? Because they had to. There was no alternative. And they are the world leaders in green battery, recycling, uh, all sorts of kinetic and dynamic braking systems of any bus company on the planet. They have become remarkable because they had to. They did it by being radical and relentless. So, for all of us in this room, whether it's rowing, we had to design a way forward. Pencils, design, devising, developing. Buses, radicalization, wrong word, radical, and relentless. But what I would say to you is, how are you going to do this on Monday? In your libraries, in your offices, you need to hurdle, you need to overcome problems, you need to cross-pollinate ideas, you need to collaborate with people. It's hard work. It requires patience. You must never give up. You must press on, knowing that there are answers out there. That means you might have to experiment with prototypes, just building ideas, use post-it notes and whiteboards, use all sorts of techniques. So here we are as we finish. You devise, you design, you develop, you deliver, and then you delight, whether it's in research or in real products. And to be remarkable, you have to be radical and relentless. Thank you.